Oscar Wilde once said, there are only two tragedies in life. One is not getting what you want, and the other is getting it. He was echoing something Buddhists had been saying throughout history. The problem isn't having or not having, getting or not getting. What makes us unhappy is the wanting. That might mean always wanting more money or possessions, and the more you get, the more you want, so being content becomes impossible. It may mean attachment to the things we already have, being afraid to lose something or someone. Or it might mean a drive to win, to beat others, even when it's not necessary. If these things are bad for us, why are we taught to compete with each other from a young age? Why are we taught competition is good for us and good for the economy? Let's find out. I'm Chris, and this is What Had to Be Said. Before I start, though, I just wanted to let everyone know that because of this whole quarantine, I'm going to be live streaming here on YouTube at around noon Pacific Standard Time for a couple of hours most days. So if you're interested, I'll be here. I should probably add to what I just said about wanting there are pretty obvious reasons why humans and pretty much all species evolved to want things. You want so you can survive. Of course, we desire things like food, shelter, and friends. But in some cultures, many of us have enough of those things already, but we still aren't content. While biology can explain the wanting itself, it doesn't really explain why we want, say, the latest fashions or cars or energy drinks. Our specific wants come from advertising and related media. And like all other ideas that form part of the propaganda, these wants trickle down to everyone and our expectations rise. Why do we need to buy an expensive rock and throw a bank-breaking party just to get married? Because that's what's expected of us. Advertising encourages us to compare ourselves to others, to want to be better at everything society values, regardless of what you think, like attractiveness and productivity to have more money than others, and not just more money, but more symbols of money, like jewelry and fast cars. The result of this keeping up with the Joneses is always dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction leads to more consumption to fill the void inside us, sometimes going into debt or chasing more money, not to mention overeating, anxiety, and depression. Our parents chased promotions and raises and pensions and stock options for 40 years just to end up downsized and in debt. Are we going to do the same? Are we going to continue fighting each other over scraps? But business owners get rich off this work-consume cycle, so they continue to promote it. They want workers to compete with each other for jobs, promotions, commissions, contracts, and so on, so they never realize they could unite to seek their common interests. Workers in competition are atomized individuals who focus on their own financial interests. In most cases, they, they don't get what they want, no matter how hard they work, because, because jobs, promotions, grants, etc. are too scarce for more than a few people to have them. If they stopped competing, they could work together to share in the prosperity they created, rather than just letting it go to a few owners and managers like it does now. They could go on strike for higher pay, better hours, better working conditions. In fact, they could organize to take over the whole company, or at least the physical parts of it, if they're really well organized, and run it cooperatively, but not if they're still in competition with each other. So this competitive mindset, this competition ideology, comes out of the propaganda of the capitalist class, just like most of our beliefs. And like most of our beliefs, it spreads at the lowest levels. 
Parents and teachers get us competing with each other right from the start. They create winners and losers, sometimes pressuring kids to win because it's shameful to lose. They're shaming 50% of the kids at any given time, if not more, since everyone's going to lose sometime, because of games that are supposed to be fun and innocent. We even tell each other competitiveness is in our nature, without examining what that actually means. If it means that competition is part of the struggle to survive in nature, then okay. So it's not really relevant in modern society. And besides, by that logic, you could just as soon say killing is in our nature. Doesn't mean we should encourage children to do it from a young age and base our society on it. In pointing out the very flimsy justification for competition as inevitable fact of nature, Stephen Jay Gould said, the equation of competition with success in natural selection is merely a cultural prejudice. Success defined as leaving more offspring can be attained by a large variety of strategies, including mutualism and symbiosis, that we would call cooperative. Competition, meanwhile, in the modern world is not necessary or good for us. In fact, it's bad for us. Perhaps the most important volume on this subject is No Contest by Alfie Cohn. And of course, there's a link in the description, like, for all these things. Cohn looks at every available study on competition and finds it has zero psychological benefits, that kids don't like it, and it hurts us. Competing with other people encourages win-lose thinking instead of win-win thinking, making it look inevitable that someone's got to lose. It stresses us out, and win or lose, we feel dissatisfied. It poisons our relationships, leads to mistrust, envy, and contempt. It discourages altruism and empathy, as people are just considered life's losers. Instead of sympathizing with people and trying to find the causes of their misery, why do we put children through this unnecessary suffering? Well, presumably for the same reason some parents still hit their kids and most still send them to school. Because we don't know any better. And I'm not saying ditch all your favorite games. Just introduce some cooperative games to a kid's play and see which one they prefer. But I am saying don't fall into the mindset that winning is inherently good. Most competitions are contrived, and winning is pretty much meaningless. Most kids really don't like competition, but, but what about adults? Do we become competitive when we get older? Competition creates artificial divisions, and propaganda teaches us to accept such divisions as inevitable and healthy. Healthy competition. <laughs> yeah. In a liberal democracy, we take for granted that political parties should compete for power. Only a small number of people can ever form the government, so the process has to appear fair. And that's the point of competition among parties. Different parties can contest power, therefore anyone and everyone can be represented. You know, if they're in the small group of people who control the party. Different parties are portrayed as very different, but that's competition for you. They're, they're at opposite ends of what's permissible, but in fact they're usually very similar and almost on the same points in the political compass. That way, on the surface, politics looks like a game we just happen to be losing, when in reality, A, the powerful own all the players, and B, we never consented to play this rigged game for our freedom in the first place. Would you like me to punch you in the face or kick you in the face? Well, I'd rather neither of those things, actually. Well, that's not an option, so choose one. Don't you believe in democracy? 
we're told to choose one of the two sides we're presented with by someone else because those are the only options. That's it. But the options are rarely as our rulers present them to us. We're just letting ourselves be pushed into the very limited thinking of being realistic by the people who would lose everything if we started thinking outside those limits. But we don't think outside those limits. We embrace them. Take voting. You can only vote for one candidate, so voters choose their candidate, and within a week of doing that, they're so confident that the person will do everything they promise to, and everyone who doesn't see that is a fool that I need to spend many hours online arguing with. This contrived competition derails any chance of unity among the rank and file across party lines, because they just blindly unite behind the party leadership out of loyalty, even though the party leadership has no loyalty to them whatsoever. What if we had an interest in uniting to solve our problems, rather than arguing about which person we're going to hope will do it for us? Likewise, nationalism is little more than contrived competition on a global scale. We're not better than those people. We don't have to have an antagonistic relationship with them just because they're from a different place. But we're indoctrinated from birth to love our map lines and the myths we've been told about why we're better. If you're a nationalist and the people in power want you to fight in their bullshit wars, all they have to do is tell you your country is under attack. Then your brain switches off and you fall in line to support the people and systems who enslave you while telling yourself you're doing it for your country. I don't know how many millions of lives have been lost to nationalist propaganda, but you would have thought two world wars alone would have been enough. So what's the alternative to competition? Cooperation? And yes, they are necessarily at odds. Even when we work on teams, we're working against another team. Winning becomes everything. Sometimes we hate ourselves or our teammates because we lost a competition that doesn't even matter. There is teamwork within a corporation, sure, but consider what the same people could achieve outside a competitive framework. At present, pharmaceutical companies, for example, care about what's profitable and compete with each other to create whatever drugs will be the biggest money maker. Scientists at different firms are in competition with each other because that's the only way they'll get paid. Do you think they'd rather be working on baldness cures or cancer cures? If the same scientists were not forced to work for the people who have all the money, they could set their own priorities for research, pool their knowledge and resources, and share their results. Just that one change would transform the manufacture of medicine. But it's impossible where medicine is subject to market forces. I don't like the term socialism for the rich to describe capitalism. The rich compete each against each other too. Wealth is a zero-sum game, so they still try to outdo each other, get promoted over each other, or outbid each other on contracts and so on. The difference between them and us is they have class consciousness and class loyalty. We have their bad ideas, like racism, nationalism, borders, and, of course, competitiveness. Contrary to everything we've been told from birth, competition does not magically make markets efficient. Capitalism is, in fact, an exceedingly inefficient system. Capitalism necessarily concentrates money and decision-making in the hands of a small group of people, essentially the owners of the means of production. Concentrating wealth, and therefore power, in such a way inevitably leads to violence. That's how we have this unequal hierarchical society. 
Corporations spend money on taxes, managers, shareholders, lobbyists, security guards, lawyers, accountants, human resources, marketing, and advertising, none of which would be necessary in a system where people and things were free. Every dollar taken as profit or spent on the activities I just mentioned is a dollar capitalism itself has taken from those who produce. If production was shared among everyone equally, far less work would be needed to be done at each job. We could instead spend more time looking for ways to automate productive activity and further reduce the need for labor. I think two goals of any liberatory philosophy or movement worthy of the name should be to liberate us from both scarcity and work not just put a few more bucks in our pockets. Then you've got the fact that competition creates huge amounts of redundancy as firms spend billions on R&D producing competing but similar products. Instead of pooling resources and creating something good for everybody, you have any number of people working for any number of firms to produce the same products and the same innovations through the same research. You have firms such as, again, going back to the pharmaceutical giants, they're all competing for scientific research into the same things. And, and that's why they spend a huge part of their budgets on marketing and administration and other waste like that. Finally, competition among firms leads to paying the lowest possible wages, often resulting in slavery or near slavery as people in places like China, the Congo, and U.S. jails receive pitiful wages and horrible working conditions when an efficient system could produce the same goods without inflicting such pain on the workers. And yet, you could argue that managers working in competitive firms in a capitalist system should employ slaves, since it means greater shareholder value, because that's the only thing a capitalist system values. It begs the question to say things get made because of capitalism or because of competition, like the iPhone. They're always bringing up the iPhone. People who still believe in capitalism seem, seem to think it's imbued with, with this magic, and it's the only way to produce anything that's worth anything. It's like they think there's something about letting a few people own the company and everyone else just work for them. That, that, that's this alchemical formula for producing things of value. You wear clothes? Those clothes were produced under capitalism. Therefore, you owe all clothes to capitalism. What the hell kind of logic is that? <laughs> what capitalism really does is make it so, so rich people can always get richer, and they keep the rest of us in or on the brink of poverty. I know they're called job creators by the propaganda, but really what they do is make us work for them if we want to survive. First, they set up a system of violence that we're all forced into. That's the state. Then their system tells us we have to use money. These rich people grab nearly all the money and say, you can have some and thereby continue to live. But only if you work for us, as long and as hard as we tell you to. Everything you love about business and capitalism could be provided much more efficiently and be much more widely distributed. We don't have to lose our freedom to long working days and our health to shitty working conditions. We don't have to fight each other over these jobs. All freedoms are within our grasp. We need to stop fearing each other, stop competing and start cooperating, Stop trying to reform systems of violence and start seeing them for what they are. And stop indoctrinating children to value winning and hate themselves for losing. The results of the many studies which clear away the myths about competition's inevitability and benefits 
should mean radical changes to the way we do things, from the market economy to kids in school and at home, from examinations to debates, from meeting out justice to having fun. Unfortunately, it's fundamental to capitalism. So those who identify with capitalism are likely to have a hard time unlearning competition. Either way, if you'd like to learn more about the history and biology behind widespread cooperation, you might like the book Mutual Aid by Kropotkin. Again, link in the description. Workers should not compete with each other locally or across countries, but unite to unionize or take over their workplaces, or start cooperatives, or overthrow capitalism altogether, and begin sharing the product of our labor. We should figure out our common interests and then work for them together. Thanks, everyone. Please like this video, comment, share, subscribe to my channel so I can beat everyone else and win YouTube, yeah! Oh, and remember, I'll be live streaming here most days starting next week, so stay tuned.